All right, today we have to talk about the elephant in the room, and that is, in my opinion, the epic and inevitable downfall and cancellation of Blake Lively and, by proxy, her husband, Ryan Reynolds, that has spread throughout the internet the last few weeks like wildfire. And it's all been triggered by the release of her new film, directed by and co-starred with uh, Justin Baldoni called It Ends With Us, which covers really heavy topics of like domestic violence, abuse, you know, relationship issues, things that are really important to talk about. They're getting overshadowed by the drama that's happening on the set and at the premieres now. It seems like even in past interviews, people are finding the co-stars don't look like they're happy with each other. And we will get into that and all the rumors surrounding that and the people on the set coming forward with the behind the scenes leaks. But it turns out that even before that, Blake Lively had quite the history. Now, do I personally believe in cancel culture? No, because that removes the incentive for anyone on this planet to change unless under extreme circumstances, but that's a whole video topic for another day. People on the internet are livid over her past and trying to cancel her. And today I'm gonna to walk you through her past and everything that I know about her and why I think that this was just an inevitable downfall waiting to come. Because at this point, it's kind of Hollywood's worst kept secret that behind closed doors, people don't really love Blake Lively. I mean, she's done everything from giving a weirdly positive review of Harvey Weinstein during the Me Too downfall of him, to giving wonderful reviews of Woody Allen, getting married on a plantation, and repeatedly saying legitimate slurs over and over again in interviews throughout her history. So let's get into it. But before we get into it, if you don't know me, hi, I'm Andra. I make tons of TikToks on all these topics constantly. I'm new to using Twitter and I'm relatively new-ish to using YouTube. So make sure you subscribe to stick along with my content. But we do have a lot to get into today. Luckily, I brought my notes, so let's dive into it. So for starters, Blake Lively and her husband Ryan Reynolds have always marketed themselves as like the nicest, funniest dream couple you've ever met. And like, that's a red flag right there. Always remember that anyone who has to market themselves as a wonderful person all the time, it probably, like no one who is a wonderful person has to constantly remind you that they are wonderful. Let's just put it at that. And I mean, there's a good reason these two have always given off like high school football quarterback and head cheerleader vibes who are so overly nice to your face, but like the second they turn a corner, they're just saying horrible things to you behind your back and then they got married, never left your hometown, and never had to evolve as people, and now they're just like super out of touch and disconnected from society. Well, people are saying that's actually not super far off from the truth. So for starters, Blake Lively is actually, by technical definition, a huge Nepo baby. Her mother was an actress, her father was an actor and an acting coach, and her sister is the Robin Lively, who had a very successful acting career when she was younger in the 80s and the 90s. She was in everything from the Karate Kid franchise to literally being the teen witch, which was a huge thing at the time for a lot of younger girls. Like she was in a ton of classic 1980 movies, and she was in a lot of TV shows. Her IMD rap, B rap sheet is kind of insane. So it's safe to say that Blake Lively, to a decent degree, is a certified Nepo baby. Her family has always been in Hollywood and her sister had a very, very wide leg in the door for her to walk right into, which explains why she's not the best at acting. Even to the point where I found an old interview where she talks about how she's always been insecure, that she can't like mold into roles, right? She always needs like a creative control to change the character into something she can do, which like, Miss Girl, that just means you're bad at acting. Like being able to, to dive into a role is literally what acting is. You just admit it in this interview, you simply cannot act. But anyways, that explains why she always plays the same like rich blonde kind of airhead out of touch character in every film. Because honestly, I don't think that she's acting. I think that she's just playing herself. But anyways, for starters, there were always rumors throughout the years that Blake Lively and her co-star on Gossip Girl, Leighton Meester, did not get along, which is really strange because it's said that Leighton Meester is like one of the nicest people you will ever meet in your whole life. And they spent a lot of their formative, like developmental years on that set. So it's very strange that playing best friends all the time, they wouldn't have some sort of a friendship. Like usually in Hollywood, those kids become friends. And the only people who have ever spoken on that matter are very like PR trained and publicists or older people on the set who just said, well, they're just two very different girls, right? The very blanket like PR safe response. But they themselves have never publicly commented on the matter. And what's more interesting, if you go and look at their Instagrams of the old cast of Gossip Girl, right? 
they're all still following each other, including Lily Vanderwoodson, which people say is a big thing, but none of the core cast is still following Blake Lively and she's not following any of them. And I even found some old podcast clips of the original cast not with Blake Lively there, like joking about like a lot of drama that happened on set and then being like, we'll just leave it at that. We won't dive into it. And Army Hammer, who I honestly don't know anything about, but people are saying he's kind of a terrible person anyway, did indirectly blame Blake Lively for the reason that he got fired off of Gossip Girl, even though he was supposed to be written on it longer. He alluded to the fact that she was definitely the biggest drama queen on the set. Although take that information as you will, given his reputation and his past. Another interesting note people are making is that back around like 2014, 2015, Taylor Swift used to have this very popular core friend group of girls they called like the original girl group although yeah not it, that's not a new concept but whatever they were very well known and it included the Hadid girl Selena Gomez a bunch of other girls and everyone always wondered what happened to that friend group because they fell apart kind of around the time that Taylor Swift became friends with Blake Lively now, while there was a lot of other drama happening in the friend group, right, that caused it to fall apart, there are a lot of records allegedly stating that Selena Gomez has a lot of issues with Blake Lively to the point where she avoids and will not go to any event with Taylor Swift where she knows she's going to see Blake Lively there, which might be why, like, we started seeing so much less of her and people were always like, what happened to Selena? Like, why don't we see her hanging out with Taylor Swift anymore? Are they still friends? They've come out and made it clear that they are very much so still friends, but there's all these rumors that says, well, Blake Lively's always attached to Taylor Swift and Selena Gomez, who most people say is a really nice person in real life, will not be seen or go near Blake Lively. And let's not forget that Ryan Reynolds is not innocent in all of this, and we could do a whole video talking about all of the rumors and other issues people are alleging they've had with Ryan Reynolds in the past, but he has his news feed like wiped clean. Most of it isn't public and it's word of mouth. But his past relationships, fiancés and wives have had a couple of interesting things to say about him here and there. And let's not forget that he met Blake Lively when he was still married to Scarlett Johansson. And despite the fact that they swore they were just friends until he was officially divorced, a lot of people recalled seeing Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds out on what definitely looked like romantic dates when he was still married to Scarlett Johansson. And Scarlett Johansson has had some interesting indirect thoughts on the matters over the years since their split. Other girlfriends allegedly said that Ryan is quite controlling and it was one of the issues in their relationship. A lot of people say that Ryan has a definite issue with his wife or you know women being more successful than him. He needs to be the center of attention and he needs quite a bit of control which makes it a little bit ironic, subtle nod to Alanis Morissette, one of his other exes, that he felt the need to get so involved on a film about domestic violence and like bad relationships and controlling spouses. But then after they were officially together, Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds both had the wedding on a plantation. And I don't think I need to explain in 2024 how insanely disconnected, insensitive, out of touch, and horrific it is to be having a wedding on a plantation. It's horrific that that's still a thing. So then they released kind of like a meh, what, like not the best, I don't know. An apology that like, I don't know, it didn't really cover up anything because then later they went on and developed some personal brands that they made like pre-war antebellum style and western style in which really didn't make them seem all that apologetic for the previous plantation wedding to continue these themes in their lives. Then continuing with their theme of horribly done apologies, uh, Blake Lively made a bunch of jokes about Kate Middleton and where had she gone right before she came out and was like, well, actually I've been gone battling cancer. She kind of made her look like a jerk. Now I won't hold it that against her like, any, that could have happened to anyone. How are you supposed to know she's battling cancer? But then she put up this apology on her Instagram story, which like absolutely atrocious. It starts by saying, I'm sure no one cares today, but I feel like I have to acknowledge this. I made a silly little post, blah, 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 gaslighty language, like out the behind. Like, why did you have, like, you just, just write a normal apology. Why'd you have to make it so bad? It's not that hard. That was just like a concerningly bad apology. 
She then also this year worked with Balenciaga and Adidas, uh, apparently, and wore their tracksuit to a football game that was highly publicized because it was with Taylor Swift. And I'm literally so below the pay grade of knowing anything about Balenciaga, but apparently they do some pretty controversial stuff relating to children, and I'll leave it at that uh, for details' sake. But it, it makes it a bit ironic that her and Ryan are so involved in other children-related organizations. Once again, just proving how tone-deaf they really are. She's also been heard saying the T slur in like tons of interviews at this point. Like, uh, like a weird amount. Like why you, no one on your team is telling you not to use that slur? My goodness. She also had rave reviews of Woody Allen and how empowering he is to women, even after like his whole problematic spree and past came to light. Um, I know there was a while where everyone in Hollywood overlooked that, but she like continues to stand by him to this day. If you don't know what he's been up to, like go look him up. I believe there are some allegations against him and his adopted daughter, and he also got married to his stepdaughter. So I don't think I have to dive into like maybe distance yourself from this man, good lord. And then for some reason continuing this theme of like ignoring her fake feminism and like supporting women and victims and standing by like the worst men in Hollywood during the literal Me Too like downfall movement of Harvey Weinstein, she had nothing but like weirdly not bad things to say, we'll just put it that way, about Harvey Weinstein. She's quoted in an article in which they ask her about it just denying that she ever had any bad experiences with Harvey Weinstein, right? Like really backing him up, um, saying that like, you know, no bad experiences here. I don't know what's... And then also throwing in, I do believe in humanity enough to think that this wouldn't have just continued. Like gaslightingly almost like, what are you implying that like, oh, why didn't these girls come forward earlier? Like, why are they coming forward now? Like just... Why did you add that? Because then she goes to the rest of the article being like, but we stand by women, of course, of course, of course. No, like what you said prior to that negates your like fake standing by them afterwards. And so then I did a deep dive into that because like why wouldn't women in Hollywood around that era like speak up, especially if they knew Harvey Weinstein personally so closely as it seems she did. And it's because Harvey Weinstein uh, went on to back a publicist named Leslie Sloan. She was a huge publicist at the time. She worked with a lot of stars. I know Megan Fox was one of them, a bunch of other big names. But then she left that like publicist team to go and work on her own, or maybe she was fired, whatever. She, she started her own venture and she asked her clients like Megan Fox and many others if they wanted to come with her, but they said no. And I'm assuming it's because Harvey Weinstein was a huge backer for her new solo venture. And they had like a good enough head on their shoulders at the time to realize like, maybe we shouldn't still all be on his payroll. But interestingly enough, if you go look up Blake Lively's current publicist, you will see, oh, still Leslie Sloan, still, Still allegedly then on Harvey Weinstein's payroll indirectly, you know, funded by Harvey Weinstein. That would explain the silence around him. And then of course we have the insane amount of interviews of her surfacing being like a total mean girl or rude in the interview. We have this one specifically that's going viral that's titled like, what you can find it on YouTube, like the interview that made me want to quit journalism or something like that. I'll put it up here so you can see it in which the interviewer literally like congratulates Blake on her baby bump because it's known that she's pregnant, like that's the, and she rudely comments on the interviewer's body after that and then proceeds with her co-star to just like mean girl insult her for the whole interview. And there's tons of other interviews of her just like being super disconnected, like super just uh, coming forward. I won't even get into speculation, but particularly this one has gone mega viral with their It Ends With Us media campaign right now, which again is surrounding marketing this film that centers on uh, women's issues like domestic violence in the relationship and, and assault and abuse and things like that that are very heavy, very serious. And when the interviewer asks Blake, like, well, essentially, what would you do like if these victims, you know, who were touched by the film, like came up to you and wanted to speak with you or connect with you? She, like, I think was trying to make a joke or something. She just responds in the most rude manner possible. And she's like, what, do they want my phone number? Do they want my address too? Like, well, not entitled to speaking with me sort of vibe. Like, like, yeah, no one's saying that they're entitled to speak with you, but they were just like, 
infinitely better ways you could have responded to that question that wouldn't have made you seem like such a horrifically awful person, especially towards victims that connect with the story you're trying to tell. You're taking their story and you're, oh my gosh, I just, I can't, don't let me get into it. But that's where things start to get interesting here. Because as you'll notice, she is using this film very much so to promote her own personal brands, right? She's using her Betty Buzz drink line here to throw a, a promotional event that's supposed to be about the film. She's making it all about the florals and trying to relate to that. And she's in interviews being like, go grab your girlies, grab your friends, you wear your florals. She's promoting it like it's this like fun chick flick whatever film when it's literally like an extremely serious film. And she's putting all of her businesses and herself and also trying to cross promote the marketing of this film with her husband, Ryan Reynolds film, Deadpool, which we'll get into in a minute. But here you can see her again, continuing the floral theme through the launch of her hair care brand, which people are giving like terrible reviews. And it's allegedly they're having insanely high return rates back to Target because people are just not loving them. Again, just like really tone deaf, you can see she's promoting her businesses and you'll notice she didn't start like actually promoting the themes and important message of the movie until she got called out recently. And now suddenly out of the blue, she's finally promoting that, which no one knew it was about until she got called out for it. And so now there's all this drama on set because you'll see this direct contrast with the way that Justin Baldoni, her co-star and the director of the film is trying to market the film. Immediately you'll see in his link tree, in his bio, he gives like women a link to go and find resources. When he's been doing interviews, he's focusing on asking people the hard questions, you know, and not like reminding people, don't ask women why they stay, things like that. And here's what people are saying. If you look back at Justin Baldoni's brand, you can tell that the message and like the weight of this film is super important to him. Back around the Me Too movement era, he did a TED talk and he has podcasts, he's written multiple books, asking men like to do the work, encouraging them to go to therapy, telling them like we have to do better. Like this is very much so like important issues to him. And I myself haven't personally seen the movie, so I can't say whether or not he accomplished this successfully, but I do think that like hiring him and his male perspective on to be the director of this film was really interesting because I would argue, yes, that like men have more to learn from this film than maybe women do because women, we know this pattern. We've seen this story play out, unfortunately, a lot of us. And he's even emphasized, yes, it was really important to him to make the, the male lead, right, very human and not the obvious monster because that's like how it happens, right? You fall in love with this man. You need the audience to connect with him, to fall in love with him as well, the same way you would in real life so that it's all that much more like heartbreaking and, and gut-wrenching when it turns out that he's not a good person. And so the audience, just like the character in the film, is like conflicted on what to do. Do you leave? Can you leave? All these questions. And I do think that was an interesting angle to bring onto the film and something he's really passionate about and making audiences fully understand and realize is a huge problem. And allegedly people on set now have been coming forward saying that Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds came in, right? And they wanted this project to be more about them. They wanted it to be the center of attention. Blake wanted to use this as her like Barbie Oppenheimer, you know, it ends with us Deadpool moment. They're saying that Ryan Reynolds even came in and tried to rewrite some of the scenes allegedly during the writer's strike, which again, oh my gosh, add it to the list of problems with these two. But on brand, he very much so tried to come in and take control. And it seems like people are saying that Justin Baldoni was the only one like really fighting back, really putting his foot down and not having that because this film is important to him. All of this has gotten so out of hand that Justin Baldoni has had to hire like one of the most prestigious PR crisis management uh, people in all of Los Angeles, which is fair because if you're going through a huge PR crisis, this is the person you probably want on your team. They've worked with the Chainsmokers, with Johnny Depp, I believe, I think with Drake and also one of the Paul brothers, which, you know, that's the person you want on your side. Yes, they are a PR crisis veteran. And so people on set are saying that Blake Lively did what classic mean high school girls do, right? Didn't get your way. 
So you decide to try and start drama, divide the cast. That's why we don't see a lot of the cast now in interviews with Justin Baldoni. And there are rumors that he has dropped out of being a part of any sequels or anything related to it. So Blake Lively would still be there for the sequels. So if you want to be tied into the, the good side, the easy side of production for the sequels, you would want to, at this point, be publicly taking her side. Although we really don't know what went on behind the scenes here, and we honestly might never know truly, uh, it is obvious that beyond this, outside of the film where all of this is now coming to light, Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds, not the best people in Hollywood, quite the reputation, and yeah, it's never been my personal favorite, so... If you enjoy my deep dives, please make sure that you like and subscribe. I do them every once in a while. I do them, I, I, I don't know what else to say. That's my summary. I don't have a perfect outro worked out yet, but that's my two cents. I've never been a huge Blake Lively fan. Uh, I've never been able to really relate to her. She's always seemed a little disconnected and a, and a little bit mean girl energy, in my opinion. I've never met her personally, I guess.